today I'm having a different kind of conversation. Uh, the conversation we're having today is zeroing in on abuses and misuses that we see within the charismatic world. Uh, as many of you guys probably know, within the church, the term charismatic can uh, cover a broad spectrum of beliefs within the Christian church. Everything from your classic Pentecostals, your Assemblies of God, your fourth square, four square, all the way out to your more extreme word of faith and prosperity gospel preachers uh, like Kenneth Copeland and Joel Olstein and such. And so what we're really wanting to do is zero in on certain practices and behaviors within the charismatic world that come out as being quite damaging and even unfortunately in some sectors of the charismatic world even being straight up heretical. And so I'm joined today uh, or I have joining me today, Pastor Jason Oaks and Mike Bohm, who is a pastor of a Calvary Chapel in um, Colorado. And we are going to tackle some of these issues that we see within the charismatic world. And one of the things you're going to see is that we don't necessarily agree on everything as well doctrinally when it comes to the use of the gifts. However, we all do agree and we, uh, to varying levels, believe that the Lord does still work in mighty powerful ways. And as you're going to see, some of our dis agreements come out in this conversation. The one thing we do agree on is that there are certain practices and teachings within certain sectors, not all, but certain sectors of the charismatic world that the church needs to be aware of and we should avoid for our own personal spiritual health and the health of those around us spiritually. So I hope that you enjoy our conversation. Sit back, relax, and I'm going to let uh, Jason and Mike introduce themselves and tell a little bit about themselves, and then we're going to get into our conversation. All right, guys. Well, today I have joining me Jason Oaks and Michael Bohm. And so I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves to you here really quick. So why don't we go ahead and start out with Jason? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? All right. Well, I'm a pastor in uh, Roundup, Montana, Emmanuel Baptist Church. I happen to be have the privilege of pastoring this guy's dad. Uh, and um, I am also a PhD student at a Dallas Theological Seminary in the area of New Testament, and um, that's basically what I'm doing right now. Awesome. Mike, why don't you tell a little bit about you? All right. So uh, I am an associate pastor at a Calvary Chapel in Berthoud, Colorado, uh, also uh, the host of a podcast, uh, youth Apologetics Training. We actually just changed the name to Answer Ready Ministries because it has a little bit more of a fun sound to it um but uh anyway yeah uh love the subject of apologetics i was saved in a hyper charismatic church um so i think i might have a few things to say about our topic today yeah and guys i'm i'm really excited about the talk that we're having today because um I know both of you guys, you know, you come from kind of different backgrounds, but at the same time, the three of us all kind of share also a little bit of a, a Calvary Chapel route. Like Mike, you're currently a Calvary Chapel pastor. I was a Calvary Chapel pastor for a number of years. Jason, you've definitely, uh, in our conversations, have shown affinity to uh, Calvary Chapel in the past. And so, uh, you know, I kind of think with that in mind too, you know, before we get into this talk today, where we got to be honest, we are going to be criticizing a uh, certain... Uh, branch within the charismatic world you know and we we got to own that you know but of course the bible does tell us to some to criticize to be discerning you know to point out when error and wrong comes in but at the same time i think it's good for us to also be honest even though we might come at the gifts from a different angle and we might have some different interpretive ideas of how they should be handled they should be structured we also want to make clear at the same time we do believe in the holy spirit we do believe in the ministry of the holy spirit even some of these groups that we're going to be criticizing we're not saying they're all damned lost sinners you know, we believe a lot of them love the Lord and know Jesus. They just bought into some walk, um, you know, wanky doctrines. And also that, um, although we will say some of the teachers, though, we're not too sure about, you know, and we're going to be, we're going to name some names here because I think it's the right thing to do and kind of explain our real concerns with them. But one of the things I do want us to touch on before we get into it, though, is kind of sharing a little bit of our own background and theology when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit today. And so, Jason, you want to go ahead and start off giving us a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, interestingly enough, um, when I 
was 14 years old, I had leukemia. And uh, when I was well enough, uh, during that experience, I had just a powerful encounter with the Lord, uh, kept me from committing suicide. Um, and I, I fully committed my life to him. And when I was able to health-wise, I went to church. Now, the church I went to was the church that my aunt and uncle were going to, and my dad had just gone the previously the week before, and it was a Word of Faith church. And that Sunday, when I went at the end of the service, the pastor said, if there's anybody here who um, is sick and needs prayer, and I would like to be healed, um, come forward. And I just felt like I was supposed to go forward. He asked me, what, what am I praying for? And I told him, and he took some oil, and he touched me on the forehead, and I said, touch, not, you know, shove. Mm -hmm. uh, and I felt this electric it, feeling go through my, my body. And I was just shaking, and I was just bawling my eyes out. I went back to my seat, and I said to my dad, I said, something happened. And uh, sure enough, it was uh, several months later, as I was getting all this coaching from people in the church of all these, you know, uh, scriptures I could be praying for and over and claiming and all that kind of stuff. And I was doing all that faithfully. And um, one day, my oncologist calls me and says, why aren't you taking your chemo? And I said, well, I am. I was mostly on pill form by that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wouldn't believe me. She says, I'm looking at your blood counts right now. It's they're too high for it to be possible that you are taking your chemo. And so she talked to my mom for a little bit and I'm processing. And I thought it all of a sudden just clicked what she just told me and what I had believed uh, had happened. And uh, she had told me, hey, you were healed of your leukemia. And um, so I, I, that was my, my first experience, of course, with the word of faith. I saw a lot of other really cool things that happened in that church as I continued going. And in fact, that's the church when I was, I can't remember exactly, 16, 17 years old, where in the middle of a worship service, I just felt like the Lord without an audible voice, you know, saying, but I felt like the Lord saying, uh, you're going to be a pastor. And wow. after the service, I went up to the pastor and I said, I think I'm supposed to be a pastor. What do we do? And he told me, well, if you're serious, you should go to school. And I was like, okay, that's a horrible answer. But in the <laughs> meantime, I had started going to, to youth group at a covenant church down the street. Um, and that's where, um, you know, my youth pastor really took me out under his wing and everything kind of just went on from there. And the Lord moved me away from the word of faith church as, um, I started pursuing my calling in earnest, um, mm -hmm. but I have some pretty foundational things there. I really admire their, um, I really saw people praying like they meant it there, mm -hmm. like praying specifically, believing that God was going to show up and do something. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to, I have to give credit, you know, for that. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, an unhealthy emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Um, mm -hmm. And my aunt and uncle, you know, oftentimes, oh, how was church? Well, so-and-so had a word of prophecy. So-and-so got slain in the Spirit. So-and-so, you know. Um, yeah, but what'd you guys talk about? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, but Holy Spirit-wise, uh, I am a continuationist. Uh, Card did an I when you got healed personally of leukemia, you know. Um, and I have absolutely no problem praying for people in my church um, when they have uh, sickness. And I'm often sought out when somebody gets diagnosed with cancer, you know. Um, and I, you know, they, they, they see encouragement regardless of their particular situation in hearing my, my story. Mm -hmm. um but ultimately i think uh i believe in healing i believe but uh one distinction i would make uh, that i just want to highlight and it was actually a calvary chapel pastor i was listening to who highlighted this when he was talking about the difference between romans 12 and first corinthians 12 is that in romans 12 paul is clearly talking about grace gifts mm -hmm. and 
he says in another place, he says the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, right? Mm -hmm. And when you get over to first Corinthians 12, though, he uses the word manifestations. Mm -hmm. And a manifestation is something that God can choose to do at any time through anyone as often as he wants to. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the confusion lies. Mm. Because that's where you see him talking about healings and interpretation of tongues and all these other things, these so-called sign gifts that some people label them. Um, I think the abuse comes from somebody who says, I have a gift of healing. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we're going to have a healing service. So show up at seven o'clock tonight because the Holy Spirit is on the agenda you know, <laughs> he's going to show up. And you, if you show up, you're going to get healed. Mm -hmm. I think that's really where some of the abuses come from is kind of uh, the differentiation between what is a gift and what is a manifestation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think what you're bringing up there, Jason, is something we'll definitely probably unpack more as we get into the conversation, because uh, that's something I would agree with a lot, too. And I think that's where even there's a lot of confusion. And even I even think within some of the uh, cessationist world, there's some confusion there as well, because they read the Bible thinking all of those gifts were always active all the time on demand when you read the scriptures clearly. And that wasn't the case even with the apostles. And it's definitely not the case today as well. And that's where I would, I would agree. And we might have some nuances there, but I think that was a very good differentiation you brought out there. All right. And Mike, why don't you tell a little bit about your background then? Okay, so <clears throat> I was saved in a hyper charismatic church. I had a couple friends that would come over um, and talk Bible prophecy with me. Um, we were definitely up to no good in those days, but they were new Christians and I was a non Christian at the time and they were attending this hyper charismatic church. And eventually I, I, I realized this Bible is the word of God. And I started attending with them at this hyper charismatic church. Um, the church, uh, I think, had some cult-like tendencies to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have, uh, in contrast to Jason, a lot of baggage, okay? Um, I think that uh, if you were to categorize me, ooh, I, I wouldn't claim to be a cessationist by any stretch. Um, but I, I tend to tread close to that line. Uh, I know that God moves. I know that he moves providentially. Uh, I have seen people get healed. Um, and uh, I've, I've even had uh, at one point a, a very, I, I'm always real reluctant to say things like this, but a dream that very well felt prophetic in nature. Mm -hmm. It was powerful. It was very powerful. And so I think God absolutely can and does move today. Uh, I love the 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 uh, line that that jason drew there between manifestations versus somebody walking in in the office of or having the gift of healing um you know there's there's all kinds of people benny hinn who claim to have a gift of healing and then they're going to have this big healing tent revival type thing mm -hmm. um and uh, i i don't no, I, I've been to so many of those. I've been to so many of those. And the people that have the obvious bona fide, like this person is missing a leg. Mm -hmm. This person is missing an eye. Those types of people are not the ones they call up. They call up the people that have the Ill illnesses that you can't see, you know, the backache, the migraines and and, you know, you get caught up in the moment and suddenly you're jumping up and down. Woo, I got saved. But what about that guy that's missing an eye? You call him up, you know, and mm -hmm. hey, you know, put your hand on him and let's see if that eye, you know, put, hey, there's my eye. All right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't see that. You also don't see them walking into a hospital mm -hmm. and cleaning it out. If they had that gift, they should, they're either being selfish with it, which I don't think is the case they don't have that gift. Mm -hmm. um, but there is, there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of adrenaline that happens in these movements. And I know I'm, I'm completely rabbit trailing. That's what happens. <laughs> I get all excited and I start talking anyway. Um, 
I was saved in a movement like this. Um, I will agree with you, like you said at the very beginning, I think most of these people uh, caught up in the Word of Faith movement, I believe that they are saved. Uh, they absolutely love the Lord um, to the extent that it's, it's very commendable. I love their zeal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love their music. I wish it was a little more doctrinally founded, but their music is fantastic. And I wish that there was a way that um, the church could marry that zeal with solid biblical teaching. If you can pull those two and put them together, mm, that, that sounds to me like the church in Acts. Uh, where they're just fired up and they're going after it and they're willing to face death um, to share their faith. Uh, so I think, I think that kind of sums up the answer and a whole lot extra. Yeah. Uh, so I'll give it back to you, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I appreciate that too. And to really be quick, you know, to let people in on who uh, might not know my uh, history with the Holy Spirit and gifts of the Spirit really quick. Um, I grew up in a very conservative church, very, I'd say Baptistic, even though it wasn't Baptist, but it might as well have been um, in rural Montana. And the only experience I ever had with the miraculous side of the Holy Spirit was hearing missionary stories and, um, you know, from far off, you know, mission fields, you know, where they might have seen a demon cast out or somebody healed and stuff. But I never, uh, outside of a few experiences I don't want to get into right now, uh, you know, I never really saw God move mightily until I actually went on a missions trip experience. And uh, here's the funny thing where I, I knew this was going to come out because it always comes out, you know, you guys are talking about not liking healing events and all that kind of stuff. And I have to say, by and large, I agree. But this is where I have to put my cards on the table. I went, I was with the healing crusade in South America. I mean, ah! that's what we were doing, <laughs> you know, and it was totally, new. you know, it was with a missionary who at that time, I didn't know anything about Bill Johnson and Bethel. They were very much connected with Bill Johnson type theology. I didn't know anything about that. And it's funny because like I got Bill Johnson's book when heaven invades earth on my bookshelf here. I don't encourage it to anybody, but I had to read that before I went, you know, this was back in 2007, but here's what I do have to say though. When I was there, we were preaching the gospel and it was the gospel. I mean, it was just straight up gospel oh, presentation. Good. We were preaching Jesus. And um, after we had preached Jesus, we would just be standing up in the front and we would say, if anybody would like prayer, come forward. You know, it wasn't bringing anybody up on the stage. There was one point when the locals tried to shove somebody up on the stage, which made me really uncomfortable because of everything you guys just talked about. I'm like, this is wrong. This is bad. But then even later, when I talked to my leaders, they were like, we're sorry. We're not into that. We don't like that. You know, that was something that the local leaders, the local churches there, which were very Pentecostal, traditional kind of, you know, oh. like that. And so, um, but during that time, I do have to say, uh, when I was praying for people, I saw people get healed of, of various things. Not everybody by any means was healed that I prayed for, but one that has always stood out to me was an older lady who came walking up to me who was blind. And you could tell because her eyes were just clouded over. I don't know if that's a cataract or melanoma, whatever that is, just totally yeah. clouded over. And I laid hands on her and through a translator, you know, I was praying for her. And after I got you know, prayed once, I asked her to look me in the eyes and her eyes were a little bit clearer, but they were still clouded over, prayed again, a little bit better, prayed a third time and her eyes were just clear. I mean, just straight clear. And me, you know, and the translator, we were just like, holy cow. And it's like, and I've never seen anything like that. And nor have I ever seen anything like that since then, you know, but uh, suffice it to say, you know, I mean, that has definitely put me in a place where it's like, I believe in the gifts. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of prayer. I absolutely believe God doesn't always heal, you know, so I would disagree with a lot of people who would say, you know, it's the Lord's will to always heal. But at the same time, I do believe there is a connection between seeking the Lord, you know, honoring the Lord and putting ourselves out there to pray, uh, you know, with uh, faith and anticipation that God will respond. But at the same time, I also recognize there's a lot of bad doctrine in a lot of the charismatic world that unfortunately I think has taken away from and polluted a lot of the works that God does want to do because there's so much, you know, like you've talked about, ex Mike, excitement and enthusiasm that people get caught up in. And so there becomes a lot of emotionalism as compared to actual moves of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the charismatic world in general tends to be so 
theologically sloppy. It's embarrassing yeah. listening to some of their preachers and teachers, you know. And so I think that unfortunately has caused quite a riff and a divide between those who desire to be uh, doctrinally conservative and precise in their language and the things they teach, and the other part of the world that is so of the Christian and charismatic world that's so obsessed with experience that they're willing to accept any teaching as long as they think it might bring them a new experience. And I think that's dangerous, you know. And that's actually what led me to Calvary Chapel for a number of years because here I found a group that was all about word, 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 and they believed in the gifts of the Spirit. And so I'm really thankful for the time I spent there. So. All right. So that's kind of my, you know, my background, you know, and I could share some other stories, you know, but um, I, w- I want us to get into the discussion then. And we've already talked about this, obviously, kind of touching about some of the concerns we have. But let's zero in and do a little bit of labeling here, because I think this is important, because I think uh, there's too much criticism coming from the cessationist world against the charismatic world as a whole, where I often get in uh, arguments with people on videos when they will, you know, I saw this one, it was Paul Washer confronts Pentecostalism and charismatics. And all he did was attack Bill Johnson with NAR and um, oh, what's it, Benny Hinn with Word of Faith and Kenneth Copeland. And the whole time I'm sitting there, it's like, you know, that's only one part of the charismatic world. That's not the whole world, you know? And I think mm-hmm. this labeling is way too broad. And so that's why, like, in our discussion here, I really want us to zero in on the word of faith movement, you know, and that particular branch of the charismatic world and how we see it influencing uh, kind of the rest of the church. And so let me kind of ask you guys, when we talk about the word of faith movement, how would you guys define that movement and kind of that mm-hmm. part of the charismatic world? <laughs> okay that one's hard uh because it's so loose it's kind of like um you know a person trying to teach about witchcraft Ooh, bad analogy but because there's so many different flavors that are mm-hmm. out there or to teach about the new age movement um because there's there's so many teachers that you would call authoritative in that field but um I guess most people trace it back to a guy named E.W. Kenyon. um, And he was studying somebody who was part of the new thought movement, a a guy named uh, Phineas Quimby. And Quimby had a lot of strange ideas that um, you find common in the word of faith movement. The, The idea that your words and your thoughts can have a supernatural impact on the world around you. Um, and so he had these ideas, um, Phineas Quimby and E.W. Kenyon took some of those ideas and, and, and really brought them into Christianity. Uh, interestingly enough, kind of a rabbit trail that we don't want to take today, but, um, uh, um, Mary Baker Eddy of Christian science also was studying, uh, Phineas Quimby as well. And she took a lot of those ideas into Christian science which is not Christian or is it science? But um, uh, anyway, uh, then another guy came along, Kenneth Hagan, and he would be somebody that a lot of the listeners here would be familiar with. Kenneth Hagan took a lot of these ideas from Kenyon and really Christianized them and brought them into the church as a whole and made them palatable. Mm-hmm. Um, the Word of Faith movement um, it, it, it is a movement that, just like it sounds, word of faith, um, one of the most prominent teachings in this movement is that your words and your thoughts can influence the supernatural. So, okay, sure it's true that if you have a positive outlook on life, if you have a positive attitude, you're more likely to succeed in various areas. You know, you, you, you go into, I don't know, some sports thing and you're and you have a positive attitude about it. You're more likely to perform better. You walk up there to, to, to teach your sermon. You have a negative attitude. You're scared. You're nervous. You're, you're probably going to mess a few things up and, and, and you know, flop around a little bit. Um, that much is true. But where they're at is you can you can say positive words, for example, about your health. And supposedly it will supernaturally call into existence better health for yourself. Mm. So you find yourself uh, lying about reality when you're in this movement. So 
let's say that uh, you, you had a, a test and it turns out you've got some form of cancer. Uh, somebody within that movement would see the words of the doctor as a negative confession because there's positive confession and negative confession. They would come to church and they would say what the doctor said and then they would renounce and rebuke the words of the doctor and then they would confess that they don't have cancer. Mm. Okay. And all of that in hopes that their faith and their words will override reality and will cause some kind of supernatural change. Um, oddly enough, the, the, the new age is really big on this too. Yeah. You have like Rhonda Byrne, she's got her book, The Secret, which is, it's really just the law of attraction. Um, it's the same kind of idea. And so that I think is the most defining characteristic of the movement. But then as you kind of spiral out from there, you see that uh, very much they uh, believe that the gifts are for today. And, um, but they take it as far as to say that, you know, different people have um, kind of uh, will sit in the office of a particular gift. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I have the gift of healing or uh, I have the gift of tongues. Almost everybody claims that they have the gift of tongues in that movement um, and so forth. Uh, and, and so, I don't know, Jason, did you want to add something to that? Yeah. I, I, when you brought up the, the Kenyan and uh, Mary Baker Eddy, um, okay, Word of Faith is not Christian science, and I do want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing that they have in common. And Mary Baker Eddy um, was accused of actually plagiarizing Phineas Quimby in her mm -hmm. uh, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. So what you see in common, uh, Christian science is kind of like I compare it to like the Matrix, um, where uh, there is no spoon, right? Um, and that, that's basically Christian science, that all of our physical world is just an illusion. And so you can't be sick because sickness doesn't exist. Okay, so you need to believe the truth that this is an illusion and I am really well. Mm. So do you see mm -hmm. that it's the same thing? And so then when you say Kenneth Hagin, you know, um, Christianized it, uh, there's a word in the New Testament in the Greek, rhema, that they connected this to. So you have different words uh, for word. And so you have logos, which they would say, you know, this is the logos, right? That we have, we, it's a studied word, it's logic, you know? Um, and then rhema, they would attribute, and this is not uh, by good exegesis at all, um, but rhema in their mindset is a supernatural word mm -hmm. that you have received. Okay, so this comes directly from the Holy Spirit. And so that's where um, you kind of see this, you know, Christianizing of this metaphysical thought. And like he, he said, um, you see this commonality now between like Christian science and New Age and, um, and Word of Faith. And so I appreciate, Jack, that you want to distinguish Pentecostalism, charismatic as a movement or a way of interpreting the scriptures from the word of faith, because the word of faith yeah. is really kind of, they, they just kind of came out of left field mm -hmm. and were kind of rogue, you know, like they, um, they use that same kind of language that you would find in Pentecostalism, but it, like most times, you know, like they have different definitions or different ways of expressing it. And, um, that has led to um, false practices. And so that, that's what I would say to add to that. Yeah, you know, and I I'm, I'm appreciate once again that you brought that up because these are some of the distinctions I want to make clear that some people aren't, when they're criticizing this movement, aren't good about making clarity about, you know, because one quote I've often held to uh, comes from Dr. Gordon Fee, who uh, I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with. I mean, he's a very well-known, respected within the classic charismatic Pentecostal. 
camp, even though I'm sure none of us would agree with him on everything, but he had something that I ran across in a, a book that I thought was really, really good. And this is one of his students relating this. He said that Gordon Fee told me one time that the charismatic movement would be judged for two great sins, the so-called health and wealth gospel, which is all part of this word of faith thing, and the failure to weigh prophecy. You know, and this is where I've seen a lot of good scholars within the charismatic world speaking out against this and recognizing this as being more of kind of a, a cancer or a parasite that is kind of latched on to the charismatic world that has unfortunately been accepted by so many. And God is going to hold us accountable for it, is going to hold those of us within any sort of continuationist camp accountable for what you know, are we going to tolerate this? Are we going to call it out? Are we going to warn our people against it or not? You know, and so I think it's good for us to, to really recognize that. But um, I'll say yeah. in regards to that, uh, Jack, um, in regards to prophecy, um, and I had, you know, a video on my, my channel, people with free gifts, um, in regards to Mike Bickle, mm -hmm. he, which is in your neck of the woods. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, Mike Bickle was talking about that New Testament prophecy is not the same as Old Testament prophecy in that uh, prophets make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it's okay for prophets to make mistakes. And they point to passages like 1 Corinthians 14 and say, well, uh, why would, you know, the subject to the prophet, the, the prophets are subject to the prophets and all of that language um, kind of implies that, you know, you can give a prophecy, but then it needs to be weighed and then it needs to be validated and whether or not it's true or not. And then he goes on to say that the medium by which you gave the prophecy is the medium, if it, it's a false prophecy, that you need to um, say, uh, you, you come out and, and be honest about that. Um, and I think that that's, really like a, a big distinction and an important one because if you view prophecy that way um then it's kind of like um you know you know bill johnson you know gives an example of he started prophecy in his previous church by going around the table and asking them if jesus were in the room right now what do you think he would say mm -hmm. and then each person went in their turn and he said do you realize that you all prophesied mm. And so when you have that kind of a view of what prophecy is, um, that is, that's super dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's causing a lot of the abuses. Um, and, and again, have to be careful, you know, you want to make distinctions, you know, so word of faith, NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. Mm -hmm. So Bill Johnson, Mike Bickle, those guys are part of New Apostolic Reformation. Now there's a lot of overlap between word of faith and new apostolic reformation but uh word of faith is kind of like michael describes it's the emphasis on you know prosperity gospel and health you know um healing and that's based off of we create our reality with our words mm -hmm. okay so that's the the main you know core things there then the new apostolic reformation adds on to this um coming from c peter wagner and some others that um there are modern day apostles and prophets. Mm -hmm. And so that office that when you talked about people walking in the office of this and that, they, they've just taken that now and said, now we have to organize and everybody needs to be submitting to a covering. So individuals submit to a covering and um, then people in church submit to their pastor, their pastor is submitting to an apostle, their apostle submitting to probably a superior apostle and it goes up to the chain. And only when in, in that group, only when the entire church has submitted itself appropriately, can Jesus come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that that's, um, so when we talk about Bill Johnson and Mike Bickle, I want to be clear, they're kind of extreme examples in some cases, but I do believe that they have such influence that their teachings are becoming way more mainstream within word of faith, at least, if not Pentecostalism or even people who may not even be, you know, they may even be cessationist and, you know, be, um, be on, on board with uh, some of this stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and it's funny because this is something where I know there could end up even being some disagreements between us on this, because I'm going to be having some more conversations with some uh, different theologians about the gifts of the spirits later, because even like what you're talking about there about the idea of errant prophecy, that's not even something that's for in the New Testament is not even something that developed in NAR. That was primarily something that's come out of Wayne Grudem and his works, who is a well respected, uh, reformed Ooh. theologian, you know, Ooh. but I also I think that kind of touches on too how certain people can take um certain beliefs and patterns or interpretations out there and they can take them and they can run with them to real unhealthy uh i think practices kind of like what you just described there with bill johnson and even as i've heard uh numerous examples from mike bickle and such of similar types of things where you just have people sit around the table and like now just say whatever pray to the lord ask lord what do you want me to say and then speak it oh that's prophecy and it's like uh, no i no no, 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 no. That, that is, that just, that's dangerous. And even if you hold to some sort of a um, lesser view of the gift of prophecy in the New Testament than the standard that was held in the Old Testament, either way, wherever you're going to come down on that, that type of use of it is just inappropriate and you see no biblical standard for it at all. You know, I, I agree. And it cheapens, it cheapens the word of God. It, it takes, when the world looks on and they see us, or, you know, some of these people claiming to prophesy, mm -hmm. okay, and then they get it wrong. How does that translate now to the word of God? Yeah. Suddenly they're like, oh, you Christians say that the Bible is full of prophecies. Are, are they like that? Because that was, that was pretty weak, yeah. you know? I, and, oh, guys, it, 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 it really, <laughs> it puts all of these people in this, this seat of being a false prophet you know, when I was going to this church, um, there was a mentality and, and it wasn't just at this church, guys. I, I went to many of these big, you know, revivals and, and big me meetings. I was even, um, if any of your listeners know who this guy is, I was um, anointed into Joel's army by Lou Engle himself. Okay. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm part of Joel's army, apparently. But uh, um so I've, I've seen all this stuff, but there was this, there's this mentality of fake it until you make it. Mm -hmm. And that goes for tongues, mm -hmm. you know, when they're praying for you and they're putting their hand on your forehead, receive the Holy spirit, fire, fire, fire. And they're, you know, now just speak whatever comes out, you know, and, and sometimes you just got to prime the pumps and just start making syllables up. No joke. This is the kind of stuff that you're taught and you're taught to just kind of fake it. Uh, until suddenly it, it kind of sounds like you're speaking in a tongue. Um, same thing as far as prophecy is concerned. Um, this would happen probably about twice a year where we would take the entire church. We move all the chairs back, we put, stack them up against the wall. We would form ourselves into two lines. And then you would be standing across from somebody, just a random person at church. And then you would pray and we were forced, okay? we were forced to prophesy over each other. Mm. And then after five minutes or so, he would say, okay, everybody in this line, take a couple steps to the right. Everybody in this line, take a couple steps to the right. And then, so now you kind of have this little ship. Now prophesy again. I feel so sick inside because of being forced to do that. Um, I mean, really, I was, I was forced to false prophesy back then. Mm -hmm. Now in the Old Testament, you would get stoned. Okay. And that's not, you know, what we do here in Colorado. You have <laughs> bad joke. Um, <laughs> and by we, not me. Um, <laughs> but you, that was a death sentence. Okay. God is unchanging. You don't play with his word in that way. You don't claim to be speaking a word from God. If it is not from God, it's, it's, a, it's a scary thing. And so, yes, I have a very hard stance on that. And, and, yeah. and I apologize if we might differentiate there uh, on that. No, that's fine. But I'm, I'm a little extreme on that. You know, you, I do not want to stand in front of God someday and him say to me or, or you know, look at me and say, you said I said what? Mm -hmm. You know, no, I catch myself repenting of that over and over and over, which I know it was paid for on the cross. But I'm just trying to tell you, express how much that messed with me. It's not okay mm -hmm. um, that we did these kind of things. And that mentality, it was not just in my church. It was everywhere in the word of faith movement. And it was okay to be wrong. Yeah. It was okay to 
prophesy and then to be completely wrong and everybody would just kind of shrug it off and they'd still call you a prophet yep <laughs> and and so um anyway i just want to add that in there no and i think that's important because honestly i wouldn't disagree with you on that at all but let, let's go ahead and kind of zero in and going back into the word of faith thing especially when it comes to the place where it's really damaging you know within the church especially when it comes to the whole idea of you know our words having power you know, this yeah. is one of those phrases you hear within the Christian world all the time. Our words have power. Our words have power. Our words have power. And it was funny when I moved down here, I had a mindset, you know, kind of a definition of what that meant in my mind. You know, my words have power in the sense of, you know, if I'm encouraging Jason and telling Jason, hey, you know, in spite of whatever might be going on, you know, press in, the Lord's going to use you, you know, stay firm, stay committed to scripture, keep preaching. You know, my words could have the power to encourage him and to build Absolutely. him up and to strengthen him. Absolutely. But as we run across too, and as I ran across here more and more, and I even saw this in my own church when I came and took it on and people wouldn't even have recognized this, but they had bought into far more of the word of faith idea that their words have power in the sense of, you know, life and death is in the power of the tongue. Speak life, speak life, speak life. Whether it was in the idea of healing, joy, happiness, uh, you know, how we want things to turn out around us. We need to proclaim it, proclaim it, because then it will come into existence. And one verse that I'm sure you guys have heard misused in the past that I've heard misused a lot is uh, Romans chapter four, verse 17, in reference to God. You know, this was referring, but I hear, would hear people say this all the time. Even God who quickened the dead and calleth those things which are not as though they were. And that is one of those things I have heard repeated by people so much, believing that that's what faith is. Faith is having this godlike mentality or idea. I don't know if they would say that, say that exactly, because I don't think so many of them even understand what they're saying when they quote this verse, but they would quote it saying that we are supposed to act like God with the mindset of we are supposed to say things that are not as if they are. So if somebody is sick, we are not supposed to talk about them being sick. We are supposed to say, you are healed. You are healed in Jesus' name. You are healed. And, um, you know, what, you know, for you guys as pastors, when you run across that kind of stuff, you know, how do you address that? And how do you point out the error to people? Mm, Jason? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, in an in ext extreme um, form, it takes the shape of our words, or we give permission to God to act. Okay, um, so that's one end of, of things. And then the other end that's a, a real extreme is, you know, what they call the little God's doctrine. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's when you got guys like Copeland and Creflo Dollar and uh, Jesse Duplantis and all these guys who, um, you know, um, say it very explicitly, you know, that we are, uh, created after God's kind. And um, so that, that, that's the two, you know, extreme directions um, that it can go into. Um, and I, I think the only real response is really just sitting down. Um, I, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, Greg Kokel's uh, Colombo, you know, tactic and uh, just getting somebody to express themselves, you know, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Uh, I just have one more question, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. So uh, th that's probably the, the best approach because um, just come in at somebody and, you know, well, the Bible says this and this and this, you know, like oftentimes, sometimes that may work and they may listen to you, but especially if they're um, having an unhealthy emphasis on experience mm -hmm. as, opposed, as opposed to the word of God, um, you know, it, the word of God is not really meaning much at that point when it gets, you know, too far down the road. So that's how I would go about it. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree, Jason. Um, getting them to think about what they're claiming is is actually a fantastic idea. And yeah, Greg Kokel's uh, book Tactics 
one of my all-time favorite apologetics-ish books because it really it teaches you how to navigate conversations even when you're just in over your head. But there was three steps to that that Columbo tactic. There is the um, <clears throat> what do you mean by that? So they you know they start speaking words of life like you were saying, Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, you know these types of things. Well, what do you mean by that? And then the second question. Well, how did you come to that conclusion and mm. allow them to defend their position? And then the, the third part of the Columbo tactic is, have you considered this? And that would, that would be, you know, kind of where you would take them to the Bible or address some of the things that they brought up. Um, but most certainly when you look through the, the, the book of Acts, you look through <clears throat> the Bible, um, the New Testament for that matter, you don't see people positive confessing. Mm -hmm. You don't see, you got Paul who's got some kind of thorn in his flesh. Okay. He's not speaking words of life. He's flat out saying, I got some kind of thorn in my flesh and I've been praying and God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not God. I'm going to say this with faith and I'm going to twist your arm behind your back until you do what I, I believe you're going to do. You know, it, God's not a big vending machine, a cosmic vending machine that we put our words of faith into him and he spits out a, a, a Coca-Cola of, of uh, results, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, <clears throat> yeah, those types of conversations where you try to draw out of them, what, what do you really mean by what you're saying? And how did you come to that conclusion? Those are good conversations to have. And then pointing out that, you know, that Timothy, um, Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for, for stomach's sake. He had some kind of stomach problem. He didn't say Timothy. Um, you know, remember those positive confessions and speak not of the ailment of your stomach, but speak life. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You don't see those things in the New Testament. Um, not at all. And so <clears throat> really the ball is in their court to try and, and, and prove that that, that is the case. Um, and so I, I think, you know, I think that kind of answers your question. You really got to have a conversation with them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And also, you know, who would you guys say are probably, you know, we, we, we've already kind of touched on some of the more extreme guys out there, guys like Kenneth Copeland and whatnot. And I actually kind of want to zero in on some of him and especially kind of his little, little God theology here uh, a little later in the conversation. But who are some other well-known word of faith teachers whom you guys see, uh, Christians, evangelicals, conservatives, you know, kind of going to and listening to without even recognizing, you know, what it is that they're being fed or taught. Mm. Uh, Joyce Meyer comes up a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, Bill Johnson um, would be a, a big one. Um, Todd White. Yeah. T yeah. Todd, yeah, White. Todd White. Bentley. Um, yeah. th there's uh, Kenneth Copeland, of course. I think we just said his name. Yeah. Um, Boy, there there is a lot of them out there right now. Uh, Jesse Duplantis, Creflo mm -hmm. Dollar. Um, <clears throat> uh, who else do we have here? I'm starting to draw a blank. Yeah, I just had some de major dental work done a couple of days ago. And so right now I'm kind of hearing colors and seeing music, having <laughs> myself my own private Pink Floyd show. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, but I'm actually quite swollen on the side here. It was way worse earlier. Oh. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, there is quite a few of them, guys. Um, yeah. Joel Osteen. I think we Joel need to throw Osteen. him out to Osteen. Yeah, he's he's kind of a um, an entry level kind of yeah. yeah. just getting you through the the gates of the Word of Faith movement for sure. Joyce Meyer, I think would would fit that bill too. Yeah. Uh, Beth Moore is even yeah. subscribing to a lot of these types of ideas. Yeah, I've seen that more and more because I've seen her kind of teaming up with Joyce Meyer a little bit on yeah. a few things I know they had, which that was uh, when I when I first heard, saw that, I was like really disappointed, honestly, you know, because yeah. she seemed like she had a very good foundation, but she has kind of drifted off into some of that. That's actually been coming for a while. Um, eight years ago, uh, my wife uh, was doing uh, her Deuteronomy uh, Bible mm -hmm. series. And she was actually coming to me and she was like, man, this stuff sounds like word of faith stuff, like naming and claiming stuff. And that was years ago. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, before a lot of people started paying attention to like her, you know, getting words of the Lord and, you know, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are some of the, the big names, you know, you can scroll through my YouTube channel and, you know, see them. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Rick Warren, that would be, he, he's kind of on the side of that movement even a little bit, although he crosses over into the New Apostolic Reformation a little bit, Priscilla Shire, um, oh man, Ted Haggart, uh, mm -hmm. Lou Engel, uh, you, you really could go on for days. Mm -hmm. There's so many of them. Yeah, and I kind of see the um in, in another way, like the new apostolic group uh is kind of they're they're kind of taking over like the, a lot of the word of faith people that we we just mentioned, they're older. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been around for a long time. And you see guys like Kenneth Copeland handing things off to Todd, like endorsing Todd White. Mm -hmm. and yeah. you know like hey like in this case really got it you know kind of thing and um so that's something that i kind of see too is that it's it, the word of faith in terms of that being a primary movement seems like it's kind of dwindling and it's becoming more of like the new apostolic group yes yes mm -hmm. <clears throat> that new apostolic reformation the idea that everybody must uh, uh, submit to or submit to another covering mm -hmm. that is that you almost get this pyramid scheme uh, in a sense it's almost like a word of faith version of the roman catholic church because ultimately you get to somebody at the very top um, but yeah that movement <clears throat> really is seemingly taking over the word of faith movement as we speak and so you see a lot of overlap um not every word of faith there is is a new apostolic reformation type person mm -hmm. um but but certainly um <clears throat> and and actually within the new apostolic reformation you have some people who seem to be a little bit more um doctrinally sound mm -hmm. uh and then you have others that are just out there as far as the word of faith movement goes so um yeah anyway <laughs> yeah well and i think that kind of touches on the fact too i mean whether or not you're talking about word of faith or whether or not you're talking about nar i mean this isn't something like southern baptist where they got the baptist right. faith and message you know it, it, it's more kind of a just kind of basic uh flavor almost that just kind of inf is influencing certain you know aspects of the charismatic world if that's the way uh, i don't know if that's the right way to describe it or not but um yeah but okay, no, that's good. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Jason? Yeah, I was just going to say the word of faith um, it acknowledges its existence. <laughs> yeah. Um, New Apostolic uh, has this weird thing where, like, they will flat out deny its ex existence. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I think a lot of that too, because actually, I've, as I've kind of been studying NAR more, I, I definitely know guys like Mike Bickle would definitely deny it. Bill Johnson, it seems like it all depends on which crowd he's in. But I do know there are some people, though, who will say, oh, yeah, we're part of NAR. But it seems to be a much smaller group. It kind of seems generally if anybody's going to accept the label. Because I remember, oh, what was I think? Oh, never mind. I was, remember this podcast to listen to. But but yeah, I would say, you know, by and large, it is kind of one. It, it's a weird, ambiguous thing for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. But hey, okay, let's kind of touch on then this whole little God theology, because this is a doctrine that is, I think, pretty foundational for quite a few people within the Word of Faith movement. Now, a lot of a lot of people within the Word of Faith movement would, I think, be very uncomfortable to uh, fully explain it the way that some other guys will. But you look at guys like Creflo Dollar, you look at guys like Kenneth Copeland, and they will get quite um, bold in their proclamation of this little God doctrine of saying that we are pretty much deities ourselves. And I think, Jason, you already kind of touched on it a little bit of this whole idea that because we are created in the image of God, you know, God begets gods, just as dogs beget dogs, whales beget whales, God begets gods. And Adam, he would, he said in a number of places, are pretty much on the same level as God before the fall, that Adam was not in submission to God. He was not in 
uh, subordination to God. He could speak things into existence. I think Copeland has said. Uh, so what have been some of the you guys have run across that? How have you guys kind of seen that within, you know, kind of the word of faith world and whatnot? Well, I've got some fun quotes for you guys. If you'd like to hear some I, of I got, I got video know. clips if you want. Yeah. Hey, let's, let's get some hey, video clips and quotes. Yeah, do it, man. Okay. All right. Let's uh, share share screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, poop. Where's that at? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think uh, I have that disabled. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, all right. So while we're waiting for that, video yeah, go ahead. Call, yep, check go. out this. Uh, this is Kenneth Copeland. And I think this one is probably the most disturbing of them all. This is one of those that if you saw him saying it on, on your TV, you'd probably pull off a shoe and throw it at the TV. Um, he says, I say this with all respect so that I don't upset you too bad. But I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, he's talking about God here, where he says, I am, I say, yes, I am too. Whoa. Okay. That, that to me, that is, that is blasphemy. Um, quite possibly the worst possible blasphemy I've heard from any of these people. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you have like Kenneth Hagan, he says, uh, you are as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was. Every man who has been born again is an incarnation. Okay, that's Kenneth Hagan. Um, Earl Polk, he says, Adam and Eve were placed in the world as the seed and expression of God. Just as dogs have puppies and cats have kittens, so God has little gods. We have trouble comprehending this truth until we comprehend comprehend that we are little gods we cannot manifest the kingdom of god good grief crefo dollar what do you guys think he says uh what do you guys oh boy he's got some bad english what do you think wait what do you think's gonna happen when all this is over with the father's gonna take you and all those unfinished planets out there hallelujah since you're learning how to operate in this earth what do you thinks gonna happen when god almighty declares i want you to create a universe i want you to speak to these worlds and like i said light be you say light be like i say there let there be a firmament in the midst of the firmament you do the same okay that one was a little bit much that was a little confusing anyway that sounded, uh, <laughs> that sounded like mormonism right there that's yeah, yeah. actually yes it did um <laughs> <clears throat> how are those videos coming let's see still disabled it's still disabled. okay i don't know why, eh. why i'm eh. not letting you share it but we're, we're gonna we're gonna pass on that I guess. yeah okay that's okay well i will... another one that came to my mind from them uh Kref mm -hmm. Lador, um he's uh talking with ten copeland on uh philippians 2 which is obviously all about jesus the kenosis mm -hmm. doctrine you know like uh Jesus emptied himself and it starts out by saying, let this mind be in you. And he says, well, what mind are you talking about? He says, who being informed God and having equality with God. So that's, he says, that's the mind that we're supposed to have in us. Oh that my goodness. Equal, that we are equal with God. And he starts breaking it down in, uh, yeah, so um, like you said, uh, there's there's probably a lot of people even within the Word of Faith movement who would probably be unaware. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if I talk to, you know, the average um, Mormon person and ask them a question in regards to, you know, like, oh, was God once a man or something like that? Um, you know, yes, you can, that's a clear teaching, you know, within their theology, but um uh, word of faith people would probably be pretty shocked by some of those kind of statements. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think that's where a lot of people don't even understand the whole word of faith idea of our words having power, though, really finds its foundation in this little God theology. You know, when, when they're talking about positive confessionism and they're talking about speak that which is not as if it were, 
you know, they're talking about, they're coming from this idea of us being little gods, whether they would recognize that or not. And like you've said, or kind of like we've touched on here, you know, so many people will kind of embrace this stuff without recognizing where it comes from. I mean, you'll see people like Joyce Myers will talk a lot about positive confession, telling your bank account, you have money, telling yourself you're not sick, telling yourself, you know, all this kind of stuff but it all comes from this idea of us being little deities, having authority given to us by God because we are created in God's image. And I think one of the greatest perversions of this that struck me the most, because when I hear about this idea of planets and commanding, I'm just like, well, that's just, I mean, that just sounds silly to me. Like, why would anybody believe that? You know, it's not, it doesn't seem, it doesn't hit me as shocking. It hits me as just darn right silly. What hits me as shocking is like what Kenneth Copeland said. And I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with this one. Um, And this is where Kenneth Copeland is claiming to have a conversation with the spirit of God. And he says, the spirit of God spoke to me and he said, son, realize this. And now this is kind of Kenneth Copeland's weird little dialogue. He says, now follow me on this. Don't let your tradition trip you up. He said, think this way, a twice born man whipped Satan in his own domain and twice born man for Kenneth Copeland is a reference to Jesus. He sees Jesus as being born again, being twice born at his baptism when the Holy Spirit came on him. And so he says, and I threw my Bible and I sat up like that. I said, what? He said, a born again man defeated Satan, the firstborn of many brethren defeated him. He said, you are the very image and the very copy of that one. And I said, goodness gracious sakes alive i began to see what had gone on in there and i said well now you don't mean you couldn't dare mean that i could have done the same thing and he said oh yeah if you had known that had the knowledge of the word of god that he did you could have done the same thing because you're a reborn man too he said the same power that i used to raise him from the dead i used to raise you from your death and trespasses and sins he said I had to have that copy and that pattern to establish judgment on Satan so that I could recreate a child and a family and a whole new race of mankind. And he said, you are in his likeness. Oh boy. Yeah. Oh oh boy. (laughs) When you hear a man saying something like, because he's been born again, he could have went to the cross and he could have defeated Satan. He could have, you know, paid the price for sin. I mean, that right there is just straight up rank heresy. I mean, so so much of the other stuff that I see with the word of faith, it just comes across as silly, almost innocently childish where you're like, oh, come on, come on, come on. Let's reason here a little bit. Let's look at the Bible. Well, you read something like that coming from one of the leaders and it's like, that's bad. I mean, that's full on denial of gospel stuff pretty much right there. Yeah. Your doctrine of atonement just went out the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The uniqueness of Christ. Yeah. In relation to the gospel, um, you know, this last Sunday, I've been preaching through Psalms, and we were talking about salvation, and uh, some of the things that David says even about salvation in the Old Testament are pretty profound, but I was given an example of the way that the gospel is uh, preached is important, and what is the gospel? What are we actually saying that we're delivered from? Mm -hmm. And uh, Todd White recently, you know, kind of made an admission of this when he had his whole, you know, thing that he said, uh, in that he said, I, I never, I realized I had never really heard the gospel or I hadn't been fully preaching the gospel. I, something a lot. I don't want to misquote him. It but, was confusing. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, in that the gospel that you often hear him proclaiming in his videos is like, you know, you're so awesome. God thinks you're so awesome. You know, God has such great plans for you. And he, you know, he, he, he wants to give you all this stuff, you know, kind of thing. Um, and so a person hears that message and they think that's awesome. I want to become, you know, like, and so they become a Christian, so to speak, you know, they, they join a church and they, they start doing all these Christian things, but they've never actually heard the gospel, you know, because they're not aware of their sin. They've never, they haven't confessed their sin. They've never professed faith in, you know, Jesus's payment for their sin. And so that's kind of a big deal. And one of the things that I hear in this movement is uh, what they call the gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 
you know, they're going to really the beginning of, you know, Jesus's ministry and John the Baptist, you know, and them preaching this gospel of the kingdom. And to them, it's like you hear Bill Johnson and some of these guys, they say, Jesus is commissioned to his disciples to go out and, you know, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And there's even a sense in which the Great Commission if you've heard uh, some of them talk, they believe that the Great Commission is really what you e equate with like the seven mountain mandate, mm -hmm. uh, that Christians are supposed to take over these different areas of society and make the world more Christian so that it can prepare for Jesus to return. And I, um, that kind of stuff is shocking. But another thing that I kind of see them doing is and various groups, um, false groups, they do this, is they kind of find things in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, that they latch on to. And the Old Testament, in a lot of ways, is kind of like a physicalness to the salvation and to the kingdom. And he's working with Israel and all that kind of stuff. So you have like, you know, Sabbath and health codes and all sorts of stuff in there. And so different groups latch on to things like temples or the Sabbath day or, um, you know, various health codes or things like that. And, you know, we need to practice this with the word of faith. What I see them doing is they're latching on to Old Testament promises that are disregarding the curses, you know, um, but latching on to the Old Testament promises that are very physical in nature and in their in their um and so I see them on the one hand, they're latching onto those Old Testament promises. But then the other thing is I see them taking promises about heaven and then bringing them to right here. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. They will take that and say, anything that you don't find in heaven isn't shouldn't be here on earth god's will is for that to not be here on earth so that is why if you pray for healing he will heal mm -hmm. you know that god's will is always for prosperity and for healing and for the you know your life to be what he's promised in heaven essentially well and i think that touches on what i've heard described as an over-realized eschatology mm -hmm. it's the promises that we're looking forward to that have been guaranteed to us through the cross of christ and it's expecting too much now mm -hmm. you know it's expecting a full fulfillment of that now when we know the reality is in this life we will have tribulation in this life we'll have sickness you know uh the author of hebrews said it is appointed unto man once to die and then face the judgment you know and that means that even though you might receive a healing in this life like you jason you were healed mm -hmm. you know we know that that ain't going to last forever because eventually something's going to get you you know i mean your leukemia could come back you know or something else you know could happen and the reality is we're all going to stand before the lord one day unless the rapture comes and takes us first the reality is we're all going to die you know, and I remember Jason, because one time I remember you and I had an online discussion when you were uh, doing a discussion about Bill Johnson and the whole idea of his healing in the atonement. And um, because a lot of these guys love to quote Isaiah 53, verse four, you know, he's carried our sicknesses and uh, bore our infirmities, which is how uh, Matthew quotes Isaiah 53, verse four, I believe in Matthew chapter eight. And a lot of people will look to that and say, well, if Christ has paid, then it's a guarantee that you will be healed. You just have to trust. You have to exercise faith. The reality is you are healed, but your lack of faith is keeping that from manifesting, you know? And it's funny because for me, if somebody were to ask, and they would say it's because healing's in the atonement. And if somebody were to ask me, do you believe healing is in the atonement? I'd say, oh yeah, yeah I absolutely believe healing is in the atonement. And I think there's an aspect of that, even as to why we should pray for healing today, because it is in the atonement. However, though, I don't believe it's fully realized as none of us fully re realize in this life, all that is bought for us in the atonement. Freedom from sin is bought the in the atonement. But the apostle John says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves and the truth is not in you. Is there healing in the atonement? Absolutely. But we know as well, we're all going to die. 
I mean, I, this is where I love what some, how some theologians have described right now, uh, you know, the period of the kingdom that we're in now as the right now, but not yet. We mm -hmm. see aspects of it. We see displays of it. But the reality is, though, we're not going to see the full picture of the kingdom until Christ returns. So we are going to constantly be bombarded by attacks from Satan, physical problems, a continual struggle with sin, because... Christ has not yet come and set up his kingdom fully. We're just getting tastes of it throughout this life. Yeah, absolutely. I had a couple of uh, pastor friends who kind of jokingly said that they had a guy that they were praying for in their congregation and they prayed for a full healing and then he died. Yeah. And they said, uh, let's not pray for that anymore. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> God gave it to him. He gave him full healing, right? Yeah. Yep. 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 And you know, it's funny. I actually, I even know of a guy who, uh, he had been ministering to some people who were in kind of this word of faith uh, movement, and this person was trying to convince herself, themselves they weren't sick. No, Christ has borne my sicknesses and my infirmities. I am not sick. I am not sick. I'm not sick. But it was clear that it, he, the guy was sick. And it was funny because this guy said he had to bring this guy to the place of confessing that he was sick and that he was ill and that he was in terrible trouble. And then after the guy finally came to that place, they prayed for him and the guy ended up getting better. But it actually took him to come to this place of admitting reality before he was able to actually go to the Lord in actual faith as a, you know, as a child going to their father asking for help, you know. You know, <clears throat> yeah. uh, just talking about the dangers of this type of, of thought process, um, I, I can give you a couple different stories. Uh, there was one particular gentleman at our church that was in a wheelchair from mm -hmm. The moment I got saved and started going there, um, he was in his wheelchair. And one, we kind of had this healing in the atonement. Uh, um, it wasn't explicitly taught in our church, but it it was kind of one of the mythologies, if you will, floating around. Yeah. But positive confession was overtly taught. Okay. So he was constantly confessing that he was going to get up and walk. Okay. We were confessing it over him. Then there was all kinds of people that prophesied over him that he was going to get up and walk. Okay. Mm. So there's all these layers. Okay. Yeah. And in this movement, if you do not get healed, oftentimes there are two, one or two conclusions that are reached either a, you're not saved. Ouch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or B it's your fault. Mm -hmm. whatever reason you're not being healed it's your fault and 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 that poor guy he he died and he was in the wheelchair up to his death and as we were leading up to his death and it was starting to become clear that he he's not going to get up he's not going to get up and walk um you could see that he went from very zealous and out there and and really excited about his faith to suddenly he was crushed he was absolutely crushed Okay. And, I, and, and it was horrible. And, and when he finally passed, his wife kind of faded out of the church after that. Mm -hmm. It wrecks, it wrecks the spirit of somebody who's actually experiencing some type of sickness um, is everybody else is looking on at you with almost judgment in their eyes. They're like, are, are you even saved? Or you're not claiming this with faith. You must not have the faith to, to, to stand on this sickness and walk in your healing. Um, so that kind of stuff happens. Um, we had another instance, uh, actually, Jason, did you want to jump in before I jump into another story? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, you're, you're kind of touching on this in, in the real harm that yeah. this is. And what you just described is what Steve Hassan and mind control experts have called the double bind. And the double bind is when you think that there's two options or more to a scenario, but in reality, there's only one. And so in that scenario, the one real solution is you get healed. If you are a believer and you have faith and you get healed, but they think, oh, I'm praying and I'm praying in faith and that there's a possibility that God may not heal me, right? 
I'll give you another example, you know, like Mormon missionaries come to your door and they uh, point you to Moroni chapter 10 in the Book of Mormon, which uh, tells you to pray about whether the Book of Mormon is true or not. Well, you think, well, I can pray and God can give me a yes or a no answer. But if you come back and you say, hey, I prayed and uh, he told me it's not true. Well, did you pray in sincerity? Did you, uh, do you have sin in your life? Uh, do you, uh, do you really have faith? Do you want it to be true? You know, they'll come in. Maybe you should come to church with me. You know, they'll give you all sorts of different things until one of two things happen. It's either you tell them to buzz off or you say, you come to the conclusion that, oh, okay, yeah, I prayed and this time the Holy Spirit came, gave me a burning of the bosom and I, I got the right answer, you know? Um, <laughs> and the word of faith is basically doing the same thing with healing is that, mm -hmm. If you are sincere and you don't have sin and you, 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 you're a Bible believing Christian, you know, like then you will be healed. And yeah. so what happened to that guy is that crushing blow, like you said, of never getting that right answer, that that's the only right answer according to the group. And so that means that God doesn't love me or that I don't really believe in him or I have this wrong or I have sin in my life, you know, like all of those different things where it puts it on them as opposed to, you know, where it rightfully belongs is just like, okay, God chose in his sovereignty to allow you to remain in that wheelchair yeah. and that being a perfectly legitimate thing. And, you know, I'll, I'll say also when we were talking about the little God thing, there's a lot of things that we've talked about have been on more of the peripheral, you know, mm -hmm. Um, your view of healing or the Holy Spirit or spiritual gifts or those kind of things. And that's fine. But there's some core things that that really gets to. One, you know, all have sinned. Mm -hmm. If you believe you're a little God, do you also believe you're a sinner? Mm. And that you need God's grace? Um, do you, if you say you're their little God, how does that affect your belief that there's only one God? That's a pretty core essential doctrine. And how does that affect saved by grace alone? I mean, if I'm a little God, then I would just expect that God is just going to like, you know, like I have everything I need. I, I don't need, you know, I don't need forgiveness. Why would I need forgiveness? I'm a little God, you know, like, so yeah. I, I would be curious so somebody who actually believes in that to really press them on that. Like, how, how does that reconcile? Like, how do you see the gospel? What do you understand the gospel to be if you believe that you are this, this little God? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, these things are, these are touching actual core, core essential things. It's touching the heart of Christianity. And it's also, in, in some of these cases, it's practicing spiritual abuse in the life yeah. of people. And, and that's not okay. That's mm -hmm. not okay. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. You know, the, 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 another great example of just how dangerous this theology can be, um, we had a couple at our church that um, they were, the wife was pregnant, she was about to have a child, um, the doctors came forward and said, okay, well, um, after looking over, um, oh boy, the, you know, the scan that you do. <laughs> yeah, ultrasound. On the, on the, yes, there you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh my goodness, Okay. <laughs> Um, they found that the baby had some major problems. Mm. Okay. And in typical word of faith fashion, rather than address the problems, there was a surgery a perfectly legitimate surgery uh, that could have been done. Uh, but rather, this report was brought before the church. Um, we renounced it as a negative confession and, and that these words of the doctor were words from Satan. Uh, people were prophesying this baby is going to live, don't do the surgery. Um, it went on and on and on. And they decided to stand in faith. Um, that baby died. Mm. The surgery could have fixed that baby. Okay. And, and, and to the, this day, that plagues me. Yeah. Th this is the kind of stuff that does real world. This is what happens in these movements. People have their faith wrecked 
people are crushed. <laughs> they, people walk away from the faith. I've watched so many people lose their faith and walk yeah. away. And to this day, I run into them and they are not a Christian. They completely have walked away. And it's because they have seen all these false prophecies. They've seen all these healings that turned out to be not healings and they're they're gone they're yeah. gone um and, and what is the response of the church you know it's kind of like uh if you, you heard about what happened with uh baby olive at bethel yeah yeah, right? yeah. and the days and days and days of prayer and we're believing and we're standing firm and you know god is going to raise this girl from the dead didn't happen I listened to Bill Johnson's sermon the following Sunday and it was such manipulation. It, it was so ridiculous how he excused what happened and like didn't, there was no responsibility taken, no, no apology, no anything like no and it was really it was really crafted and it, it really made me sick i mean if you if you can go back and find that uh it it, it was it was really a, a great example of the kind of manipulation that we're talking about that's just really really abusive mm -hmm. dangerous Mm -hmm. And it leaves people like Mike saying that people leave groups like this yeah. and they throw Christianity out with it Yeah, because mm -hmm. it gets, it, you know, the gospel, maybe it's people who have never actually in sincerity heard the gospel because all is signs and wonders and signs and wonders. And, you know, God has a great plan. He wants to give you this and that and all the kind and maybe they've never heard the gospel. Yeah. And then they get burnt and then they leave. And then they, well, I guess Jesus isn't real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, you, you raise your kids believing in Santa Claus. And then one day the rugs ripped out from under them and they realize Santa Claus isn't real. And suddenly they look at the rest of your theology, mm -hmm. you know, you're bringing them to church and they're going, wait a minute, is God kind of like Santa Claus? You know, <laughs> but maybe that's not the best example, but that's exactly what happened. And the couple that lost their child, they were, they, they left the church shortly after that. And I think uh, that they are still believers of sorts, but now they're caught up in some really legalistic uh, messianic stuff. Yeah. Um, mm. and, and, and so, you know, it, it's very, very unfortunate. I want to say, that probably 60% of the people that I went to church with at that, that, that hyper charismatic word of faith type church, um, probably about 60% of them are no longer believers today. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. If that tells you anything, oh it's, yeah. it's damaging because they're all at the time you're all in for the experience. You're all in for the health, the wealth, you know, what is God going to do? And, and I'm going to show up today and I'm going to, and I'm going to tremble and I'm going to fall over on the floor and it's going to be this wonderful, glorious thing in God. And I'm going to get all these demons cast out of me and mm -hmm. on and on and on. And then a few years later, somewhere along the line, the realization hits you, you know what? I'm the same person I was mm. yep. four or five years ago. I haven't changed. I still have the same problems that supposedly those demons already cast out of me, but I'm still struggling with the same sins. I'm doing the same dumb things. I have the same illnesses. I'm working the same job. So either this faith is not real. Uh, I'm not saved. You know, one of these things, okay. It's my fault basically, mm -hmm. or God's not real. And they mm -hmm. walk away. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. Um, and so, you know, I think that's one of the biggest warnings about this movement is it, it just chews people up and spits them out. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it kind of goes for, um, I mean, you see things like, uh, tongue speaking amongst these groups too. And, you know, biblically 
it's supposed to be a real language. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a sign for unbelievers. It was for you to give the gospel to a group of people that didn't speak your language. That's the thing. But when you see people speaking in tongues in these meetings, it's, it's about the same. It's honestly, if you listen, each person is clearly speaking something totally different. They're not mm -hmm. speaking the same language as one. That's fine. But you always notice that there's only about two to three sentences worth of content. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of do this loop over and over and over and over. But yet, you know, they can go up and they can have a word, you know, and speak some tongue. And then the pastor will say, is there an interpretation? And, and somebody will walk up there and for about two to three sentences of content in this tongue this person will walk up and speak for five minutes <laughs> and you're going uh -uh. <laughs> you, you, you're you're <laughs> there's no way that those three sentences produced a five minute sermonette yeah i'm yeah. sorry but no that's not the interpretation um but anyway sorry i got a little rabbit trail yeah. there but it it, it 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 messes up people's faith and it drives them away from the faith people outside of the church look in at the goofiness and the silliness going on the antics of these it, it, it feels like a circus crossed with wwf mm -hmm. or i think they call it wwe right now yeah um i mean it it's antics and it's embarrassing and yep. nobody wants to be a part of it yep yep <sighs> Well, let me ask you guys, because we're we're kind of getting near the end here. It's been uh, over an hour now. Mm -hmm. um, are, what Are there any other final things as well you guys would like to add in here? You know, I, you guys have already been kind of throwing in some final thoughts, but is there anything else you would like, you know, before we end the recording here? Jason? I, I think... I, I think if anybody's listening and they have the false misconception that what they see when they turn on TBN um, or some of the things, if they've heard some of the things that we've talked about today in terms mm -hmm. of doctrine, that's not Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not saying that individuals that are part of these churches are not saved. I'm sure that many of them are, many of them are sincere. Like we kind of started out they love God. Um, I admire certain aspects of their, their, their prayer life and, and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, the gospel, just to be clear here, is that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again from the dead. Mm -hmm. And we believe in that and only that as, um, as a means for our salvation. And um, so, uh and then the other thing I guess I would just say is that uh, the word of faith does not really accurately capture if somebody believes in the gifts of the spirit or the Holy Spirit or the work of the spirit, it, it doesn't, doesn't capture that accurately. Um, yeah. I believe that they have almost two completely different origin stories. Um, and um, so I, I just, and I think that was part of your purpose you know, in doing this, Jack, is to, to help people to, to make some of these clear distinctions and to keep them away from some of the dangerous stuff. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, yeah, I think that that sums up really well, Jason. Um, <clears throat> it, you come to faith to be forgiven for your sins, mm -hmm. uh, not to achieve health and wealth. Mm -hmm. Christ died on that cross to pay for our wrongdoings, our sins, the ways that we offend God, past, present, and future. That's why we come to faith. That's the gospel. God didn't die on a cross to make us healthy or wealthy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so um, I, I think that is the, the, the most important thing to stress here. If anybody is listening to this, they're not saved. They, they do not know Christ as their savior, but they know that they're a sinner. That's why you go to Christ mm -hmm. and you trust in him for what he did on that cross to pay for your sins. Amen. Amen. So. Amen. 
and if I might just kind of throw in some wrapping up words there too, just to emphasize, you know, once again, I think you guys have gotten, have hit very, very clearly, you know, get to the gospel, know what the real gospel is, believe that. And I think we have to make sure whatever else we believe secondarily, we always first have to measure it up against the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, as we've yes. seen, like with some things like the little God doctrine, that does go to a place of pretty much denying the gospel. It really does. You know, mm -hmm. when people grab onto it there. And then when it comes to how we understand faith, the, you know, uh, how it is to function, we need to make sure that we're understanding the word of God rightly, we're not interpreting it through a false lens, but we're interpreting it through scripture and that we need to recognize thinking critically is not a lack of faith. Being mm -hmm. discerning is not a lack of faith, you know, because I know in a lot of the charismatic world, you know, there's a lot of talk of like, don't question, just believe, don't question, just believe. And the fact is, no, we have to question. You know, when we Amen. hear of somebody who got prayed for and everybody's like, woo, they're healed, but they're obviously not, just name it. That person's not healed. Now, are we saying God can't heal? No, God can absolutely heal. Are we saying there aren't gifts of the spirit today and the Lord uses different people at times as he so chooses in miraculous ways? No, we're, I, I think we'd all agree maybe to different levels that it is true that God can and does, but at the same time, we need to be discerning and to not just accept everything that's fed us. You know, as I, as Amen. I tell my church, I recently told this in a Bible study, you know, after I'm old and gone and my little church here in Missouri is talking about good old pastor Jack, I hope that they're never going up to people, you know, their new pastor and saying, well, Jack used to always say, blah, 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 blah. If they're going to go up and say anything to the pastor, I hope that they say is, well, pastor Jack used to always say to not take anybody's word for it and go to the Bible. You know, Acts that, 17, 11. Exactly. Acts 17, 11. And that's what it's got to be, you know? And so, hey guys, uh, go ahead and stay on here after I uh, cancel the recording here. But guys, thank you so much for this discussion. You know, it, it's always interesting to see how these kind of discussions are going to go. And I really appreciate talking to you guys and you guys coming on here to have this discussion with me. And I hope that it's a blessing to anybody who tunes in and listens in on the conversation that we had today. So guys, once again, thank you so much for coming. Jack, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. This was fun. All right, guys. Well, hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. As you can tell, we kind of went through down a few uh, different rabbit trails and covered a wide variety of topics, diving deep into some and kind of just glossing over some others. Uh, but that's okay, because what this was intended to be was just a basic friendly discussion about some problems that we see within certain sectors of the charismatic world. And of course, as you could tell there, Mike had definitely had gone through some abusive experiences and had come out of that and has had to uh, gain some healing healing uh, since that time and it's a major passion of his heart to not see other people go through the same hurts and pains that he experienced himself and of course Jason who did have a positive experience within the word of faith movement having received healing you know he also recognizes a lot of the dangers within that sphere of the charismatic world also and so I hope you guys enjoyed our conversation obviously it was different than the normal conversations that we have one of the things that I want you to be paying attention to in the future though is I'm going to be having more conversations regarding the gifts of the Spirit and how they are to function within the church and within the body. And I'm actually going to be having Mike Miller on with me uh, later, as well as Dr. Sam Storms. And then we are going to be discussing uh, prophetic gifts and the gifts of the Spirit generally. So I hope that if you are interested in these kinds of conversations, that you will uh, stay tuned. And please, if you enjoyed this video, please like it. If you want to uh, get notified when more content is coming down the pipe, uh, please subscribe subscribe to the channel. And if you enjoyed this and you think it'd be beneficial, please share it as well. Once again, guys, I appreciate you all so much. Thank you guys for tuning in and hope to see you guys all next time. God bless.